Good morning, everyone. So you may have noticed that I'm not Darren Lapomi. Uh, I'm a postdoc in his lab. My name is Dr. Laura Kayser. Uh, and I have a training and a PhD in organic chemistry, and this is what I will be teaching you today, or at least an introduction to organic chemistry, as much as I can do in 50 minutes. And then we have another class on Friday where I'll like, talk a little bit more about um, molecular function, how to draw molecules properly, which is the main part of chemistry. Um, so I'm going to start with the basics. Some of you may have already seen a lot of this work in GenChem. Uh, if you're bored, raise your hand and just like tell me, look, we've already seen all of this. You're wasting your time, and then I'll move faster. Um, so what I'm hoping to teach you is like, like organic chemistry is all about carbon atoms. which usually provide the structure for molecules. And then to that, carbon, uh, to that carbon frame, you can attach functional groups. And those provide reactivity and as the name indicates, functionality. And what we're also going to see is how uh, reactants generate products. and how this happens, and typically that happens via a reaction mechanism. So this is like chemistry oversimplified, organic chemistry at least. You get a carbon frame, and then functional groups, they're going to determine the reactivity and the functionality of those molecules. Then so you can take some reagents, reagents, reactants, or substrates, and transform them into something else uh, to create products. And I want to show you really like the basics of reaction mechanisms. So we're going to do a little bit of aero pushing, but I think it's good for you to learn this as nano, future nanoengineers, so that you at least can read a chemistry paper and kind of understand what's happening there. Um, I'm not used to blackboard. I haven't drawn on a blackboard forever, so I'm going to be moving around a lot and taking way too much space or not enough. So if I'm drawing too big or too little, let me know, please. Um, my email address, office numbers, uh, if you guys need to reach me at some point, can I erase that? Yeah. Okay. So, one very important thing to keep in mind um, when you're doing chemistry is electronegativity. And dipole moments. So the electronegativity is a tendency of atoms to attract electron or electron density towards themselves. So each atom uh, in the periodic table, which is over there, so that's pretty awesome. So I'm just going to like redraw really quickly part of the periodic table with some of electronegativity numbers. So we've got lithium on the left, it's like at 1.0. Sodium is at 0 0.9, potassium 0 0.8, hydrogen, hydrogen, although it's like towards the left of the periodic table, it's kind of an oddball, it has a dipole, uh, an electronegativity of 2.2, and then down here we got carbon 2.6, nitrogen 3.0, Oxygen at 3.4, fluorine at 4.0. 
And then as you go down in the periodic table, the electronegativity decreases. Three point zero, and then get iodine two point seven sulfur two point six phosphorus at two point two. So this is just a small part of the periodic table, but in organic chemistry, those are the atoms we're interested in. So this is pretty much all you kind of need to remember. And you don't need to remember the specific numbers as long as you know more or less like where atoms are in a periodic table or if you have a periodic table on hand. So the trend in electronegativity usually goes this way, where the bottom left corner uh, is the least electronegative, and then as you go up towards the right, you get the most electronegative atoms. So fluorine being the most electronegative of them all. Now why this is important is when you're drawing an organic bond, uh, the character of the bond, whether it's ionic, covalent, or somewhere in between, depends on the electronegativity. So we've got three types of bonds. We've got ionic bonds, So ionic bonds, like the classic example, is like sodium chloride. And those usually happen when you have a very different, very big difference in electronegativity. So if you look at sodium over here and chloride over there, like the difference is quite large. So this is for a very different electronegativity. So this is the sign that I usually use for electronegativity. You'll find it in some textbook, uh, not in others. Then you can have a covalent bond, a pure covalent bond. And this usually happens when you have two atoms that are either identical. So for example, in dihydrogen, you have a pure covalent bond. Or in uh, like atoms that are very similar. So uh, a carbon-carbon bond can be like completely covalent, providing its like substituents on the carbons are the same on both sides. So, for example, ethane. This bond here is purely covalent because the carbon here is in the same environment as the carbon there. So there is no difference in dipoles or electronegativity. But now most of the molecules you're going to see are somewhere in between an ionic and a covalent bond, and they're called polar covalent bond. And polar comes from polarized bonds. So if you have an atom A and another atom B, if they have a difference in electronegativity, um, let's say one of them is like 0 0.9 and the other one is at like 1.2. I'm like very random example. This one would have a partial charge, which is denoted as delta, and that's a really ugly delta. Let me redo that. Delta plus, meaning it's like mostly uh, has a plus character, and this one would be delta minus. And when something like this happens, you create a polarized bond where the electron density is mostly located towards the most electronegative atom. And overall, this creates a dipole moment which you represent with an, with an arrow and a plus at the end. I'll redraw it here so it's clear. So this represents the direction of the dipole moment, where on this side you have the delta plus. And you can remember it because it forms a little plus. And on the end of the arrow, you have the delta minus. Um, so this is like, the basis of all organic chemistry is a difference in electronegativity between atoms. 
So if you can remember kind of the trends in the periodic table, you'll be able to do organic chemistry, as complicated as it sounds. It's all about this. <laughs> Plus or minus some details and exceptions, but <coughs> you don't need to worry about any of this now. So just as a reminder, those are called partial charges. This is a dipole moment. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, to give you some numbers, so for ionic bonds, uh, there is like a rule of thumb to know if a bond is ionic, covalent, or uh, polar, polar covalent. So the ionic is usually the electronegativity difference, so the delta should be above two. Uh, for a covalent bond, it is the delta is uh, below 0 0.3. And for a polar covalent bond, it's in between those two numbers, um, around ish. OK. Uh, so just as a like, real-life example, uh, my favorite molecule, and maybe for a few of you that are over 21, their favorite molecule too, <laughs> ethanol. OK, so now, if I want to draw the partial charges on this molecule. The most electronegative atom in this molecule is oxygen. So I'll put a little delta minus here. And then from there, I assign all the others. So hydrogen has a lower electronegativity than oxygen, so it has a delta plus. And same for the carbons, delta plus. So di the dipole moment goes somewhere in this direction because it's attracted towards the oxygen here, and like you have more partial charges towards the left. Okay. Now we're gonna start having fun with moving electrons around. So when we talk about chemistry, we talk about movement of electrons. Um, so we're gonna do some arrow pushing, and I'm gonna teach you about like what type of arrow to use. So we've already seen two arrows here, two different types. We've seen, well, actually only one type of arrow. We've seen a dipole molar moment arrow, and we're gonna see like the arrow that you're gonna use when you show electrons moving, and also the ones that you're using for showing uh, chemical reactions, so when products give reagents, so, like usually the flat arrow that everybody mostly knows. So is it boring so far, or it's okay? Have you guys seen this before in Gen Chem, or not really? See a few had not, yes. Um, what is the X symbol? So the X symbol is, it's kind of a weird X. It's uh, electronegativity. So it's like a weird tilt and a bar, like that. Mm -hmm. So this is like my way to abbreviate it. In some textbook, they don't abbreviate it. They just use the full name, but it's, it means electronegativity. Okay. All right, so chemistry. <laughs> Equals the movement of electrons. So when electrons move, they usually follow the basic rules of electrostatic, meaning uh, that electrons, which are negatively charged, are attracted to electron deficient sites or positively charged sites. So it all follows this thing with the dipole moment. So electrons are always going to flow from the plus, 
uh, from like towards the plus charge or partial charge. And the way we show mechanisms and movement of electrons is using curved arrows. So curve, like you have A plus B gives C. This is like a classic arrow for like showing uh, a reaction that's complete. So like A plus B completely disappear and form C. And if I wanted to show a mechanism, I would use curved arrows. So if A was to, has two lone pair, a lone pair of electrons and it can attack B, I would show it with a curved arrow. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through like the very basic type of mechanisms uh, that exist in organic chemistry, like how you can show electrons moving. So the first one is dissociation of a polar covalent bond. So let's consider our favorite AB molecule. Um, a would be have a partial positive charge and B partial negative charge. So if we follow the rules of electrostatics, the electrons uh, in this bond, so like a bond is usually two electrons, so you can represent it this way also, but I'm not gonna do it. So like just remember one line means two electrons. So if we have two electrons moving from this bond, they're attracted towards the most electronegative atom, they're gonna go in this direction. And that gives A plus, plus B minus, and B now has those two electrons that were in the bond before. Everybody follow that? Yeah. Then you can have the formation of a polar covalent bond, which is pretty much the reverse mechanism. I'm just gonna use this one here instead of redrawing it. So it's the reverse thing. So you have your electrons here and electrons are always attracted by a plus charge. So you have your electrons and they attack the positively charged A plus atom. And so what happens is like the reaction goes the other way around and you formed an AB bond again. So here it's like reverse from over there. The third one, you can have a bond forming uh, in one species and another one dissociating in another one. So a simultaneous formation and dissociation. So let's consider X. Uh, X has a lone pair of electron and is negatively charged. So X can represent anything. Uh, let's call it like, for example, it can be a chloride anion, which has three lone pairs of electrons. And this thing can react with our favorite AB molecule. Again, A partial charge plus and B negative. So you have your lone pair minus charge. So this is like the strongest, like, yes. Yes, sorry. Good call. Thank you. Um, so this is like the most, uh, the species with the most electron density on it. So it's the most likely to attack the other and then it attacks on the plus side. 
But here, if you attack this thing, here and now you're not going to follow the octet rule I anymore. So you're going to have like more than four bonds on that atom. So you need to displace the electrons. And they go towards here. Okay. So always remember that you have to follow the octet rule all the time, for most atoms at least, except a few exceptions like phosphorus. But for the examples we're seeing here, just we're not going to do anything complicated. Okay, so what this gives, it's an X A bond plus B with the two lone pairs minus two lone uh, electrons. Okay, so you can note that the charge uh, on the left remains on the right. So if you start uh, your reaction with a minus charge, you should end your reaction with a minus charge. If you start with something neutral, you should end with something neutral, etc. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about multiple bonds. I'm going to try it here. So all the examples here we're dealing with a single bond between A and B, but you can also have a double bond. And so we call this addition of uh, an electron pair to a multiple bond. So I'm calling it multiple, uh, but I'm going to draw an example for a double bond. But the mechanism still holds true for a triple bond also. So we have X minus and uh, AB. Again, delta plus, delta minus. So the species with the most electron density attacks the one with the least. And then again, you get to follow the octet rule, so you transfer that pair of electron here, and you form a new bond. Again, you get to follow the charge, so balance the charges on both sides. And I think I have it right here. And your lone pair of electrons. Um, you can also have uh, a double bond can sometimes also behave uh, like the most electronegative species in the system. So if you react a multiple bond, so addition of a multiple bond, to an electron pair acceptor. So instead of having our X minus, we're going to have uh, something that is, like, has a partial positive charge now, or something that is called an electron acceptor. So if we have A, B, B is delta minus, delta plus, and we react it with an electron acceptor, so something that can have a plus charge. So you have your most electronegative species, in this case is B, but B doesn't contain a lone pair. So the way it works is like the double bond attacks the electron acceptor on this side here. In the end, you form a bond between the most electronegative atom in AB, so B, and uh, your electron acceptor, Y. And this one now has a plus charge. Uh, yes, OK. So this was pretty easy. So now you know how to do arrow pushing. This is pretty much all you need to know for basic organic chemistry. Any questions? Um, okay, I'm gonna erase this. 
Now let's see if we can do some arrow pushing or chemistry on acid base. So like you guys know, all know about acid base reaction. How do you draw the arrows for a mechanism for a, an acid base reaction? In this case, I'm going to talk about Brunstedt acids and bases. So, for example, if we take water, the oxygen has two lone pairs and it's connected to two hydrogens. If we react this with a common acid, hydrochloric acid, HCl, if we do our little uh, delta plus, delta minus again, we have oxygen is delta minus, the H is our delta plus, and on this side, H is delta plus, and the chloride is delta minus. Okay? I'm gonna draw those also. So what can happen is you have the lone pair on the oxygen being quite electronegative, can attack at the most positive place, and then again, to like, so that we don't oversaturate the hydrogen, we get push the electrons on the other side. Okay. I'm gonna show you a new type of arrow also, here. So because this reaction is reversible, I'm not using this type of arrow. This is for like reactions that are complete, so they go like 100% towards the product. But in this case, you can always go back, so we're not using this. We're using an equilibrium arrow. So you form an hydronium ion, uh, also called a conjugate acid, and Cl minus the conjugate base. So those are called conjugates. So this is the acid and the base. Okay. Do you guys remember what's a PKA? Raise your hand if you don't know what's a PKA. I'll answer your question after. Everybody knows what's a PKA and where it comes from? Okay, cool. So I can skip an entire section. Yes? How is that reaction reversible when you have a strong acid? It is not. It's a very good question. So the PKA is related to that equilibrium. So when you have a strong acid, that equilibrium is actually drawn, like the equilibrium arrow is drawn this way because most of the equilibrium lies on this side. But there is always a small chance to have a little bit of uh, this thing happening in solution. Why do you use the one-way arrow versus the two-way arrow then? Some reactions are complete in one direction. So for example, if you're generating a gas, so if you're generating CO2 during your reaction, that gas is gonna go away and following Le Chatelier's principle, you're gonna drive the equilibrium all the way to the right because the gas escapes. And so in that case, you have like a direction, like an arrow that only goes in that direction. So some reactions like just go all the way, 100%. But acid-base reactions are always in equilibrium. You kind of have to know a little bit, but this is what I'm trying to like teach you, like a feel for um, when a reaction is gonna go forward or when it's possible to like reverse it. Um, and when you have strong acids like HCl or even stronger one like uh, uh, hydrochloric, uh, hydrohyodine acid, uh, this one will only stay uh, towards like the right or more of the species would be towards the right. Um, so actually we're gonna talk about like the structure property relationship a little bit and like what makes the reaction go more in one direction or the other. 
They're easy. Where's this thing? There are a few effects to consider when you're looking at acid-base reaction, and mainly all reactions in chemistry. So the first one is like you got to look at the electronegativity again. So uh, the more electronegative atom, I'm just going to write down the definition and talk about it later. It's kind of an awful long definition to which the acidic proton is attached. Oops. The more polar the bond, and therefore the more acidic the proton will be. In chemistry, uh, we don't like equations. I hate equations. I know that as engineers, you're used to equations and that's what you like. I hate it. And most chemists hate it too. What they do is look at trends. Um, so we look at the difference between two things and like that's how we know the reactivity. But we're not looking at two specific numbers. So it's a little bit of a different mindset compared to nanoengineering in that sense. But I think it helps to get a feel uh, for the atoms, or what some people call chemical intuition. It's really like being able to look at a molecule and intuitively decide of its reactivity. Or like you don't decide of the reactivity, but you get an idea of its reactivity. So if we look at a trend for a few acids, the acidity of methane, CH4, is lower than the ones for ammonia and H3. It's lower than the one of water. And it's lower than the one of HF. So why is that? This has all to do with the electronegativity again. So if we look back at our little periodic table, you see that the, uh, the carbon-hydrogen bond, uh, the electronegativities are very similar, so it has more of a covalent character. So it's going to be very hard to dissociate that bond. Whereas like HF, H and F have like a very different uh, electronegativity, which makes it like more prone to uh, dissociate. So you're going to be more towards this side of reaction, like a more acidic or a strong acid. Whereas for uh, methane, you're going to be more on this side, where it's going to stay attached to the carbon. So this is what we call an electronic effect. Now, like with all things, there are exceptions and things that will make this rule not true. And if we look at an example, Uh, for halogen acids, so like HI, HBr, HCl, and 
HF. If you just look at the electron negativity, which one do you think is more acidic? Yeah, but that's, uh, if you just look at the electron negativity, HF has the biggest difference in electron ne negativity in this bond here. And so you would think this one is the most acidic, but actually it's the least acidic. So if we look at the PKAs, so PKA of HI is minus 10, minus nine, minus eight, and this one is actually very weak acid, it's like 3.2. And the electronegativity of the halide is 2.5, 2.8, 3.0, and 4.0. So that trend doesn't make any sense. But one big thing to remember is that it's not only about electronics, it's also about the size of, your, of the atoms, or what we also call a steric effect. So as you go up that trend, the acidity increases, but also the size increases. So um, usually, like atoms that are very large uh, tend to like attract like the proton better, and so like um, actually no, it's the opposite. Or like want to be dissociated from the proton better. So this is called a steric effect. So this effect is true for small things, like a single atom or a single anion, but it's also true for like bigger systems. So if you have uh, like a long carbon chain versus a smaller one, usually uh, you can like get trends in that sense also, and it can be relevant uh, later. So usually the steric effect is stronger than the electronic effect, except in some cases, but in general, this, those two rules hold true. Now there is a third one that is a little bit different from the two others. It's called resonance stabilization. And this one is easier to explain with an example. So if we look at two different acids, so it's acidity of methanol, CH3. OH. This is less acidic than acetic acid, which looks like that. Okay, so there is not a big difference between those two molecules, right? It's like the proton here is attached in both cases to an oxygen. The main difference here is this. So this functional group is called a carboxylic acid, and most of uh, the molecules that have this functional group behave like acids, and relatively strong acids too. And this is due to your resonance structure. So if you take acetic acid, and react it with water, or in water. Again, water, delta minus, can grab the proton here, and goes back to the oxygen, which is delta minus. Okay? Oops. And you form
you form this acetate. Now this acetate, that minus charge, there's like a carbon, two oxygen, there is really no good reason for the minus charge to be located only on that oxygen. So what it can do is that it can form a resonance structure. So the electrons here can delocalize down there, and then those are pushed on top here. And now we can draw what we call a resonance arrow. So this is like a double-headed arrow, and you form another resonance structure where the minus charge is on this oxygen now and the double bond carbon oxygen is at the bottom. Because you have two types of resonance structure possible, it stabilizes the conjugated base. So the more resonance structures you can draw for a conjugated base, the more stable that base will be and usually the more acidic the proton. So that's why carboxylic acids are more uh, acidic than methanol, for example. If I dip, so if I remove that proton here, I cannot delocalize the minus charge on the oxygen anywhere. So it's less stable. Okay, any questions? Okay. So we have like those three effects. Um, the electronegativity, electronic effect, we have a steric effect where we have to consider the size of the atoms or the functional group, and we have that resonance effect. Now to understand the reactivity of chemicals, that's pretty much all you need to know. <laughs> so if you can remember like those three simple rules, you're able to do chemistry. So we've shown like kind of an example for branched dead acids or base, but it works the same for pretty much everything. Uh, for example, it also works for Lewis acids and bases. Uh, so a Lewis acid uh, has atoms with unfilled valence shells. So, for example, it's not something, so this is a filled valence shell because it has this octet around it. But BH3, for example, has room, like here. It's like an empty valence shell here. So this is an example of a Lewis acid. H plus is also a Lewis acid. Uh, and some type of carbons, they're called carbocations. So you have a carbon connected to three things, we'll just call them R and it has a plus charge, this is also a Lewis acid. Okay. And then the Lewis base contains atoms with at least one lone pair of electrons. And so those can be either a minus charge, so like X minus. Uh, they can be water or alcohol or alkoxide, which are the conjugated base of alcohol. So we'll just call those OR. Uh, they can also be amines and R3 which has a lone pair on the nitrogen also. And so the way it reacts, uh, Lewis acids and Lewis base, is pretty much the same as for regular acids and base. We always do the same exercise where we like, determine 
which one has the most electron density. So if we consider an amine, and uh, we're going to switch atoms a little bit to make it more fun, and aluminum trichloride. So here it has an empty valence shell that I can, like, you can show it as a little rectangle, empty rectangle, or just put nothing. And again, you use Classic rules of electrostatic, uh, minus charge likes positive charge, so this is more of a delta minus character. This is more of a delta plus, so the text here. And you can form a bond now. And here, aluminum trichloride. So that's pretty simple, right? So it's pretty much the same thing. And now, just the last little bit, uh, is how do you translate acid-based reactions to nucleophiles and electrophiles? Like, who's never heard of the term nucleophile and electrophile? Okay, so there is a few people. So that's good, I'm teaching you something. Yay. Okay. So the last category are electrophiles and nucleophiles. So electrophiles comes from the Greek electron friendly and the nucleophiles comes from nucleus friendly. Electron friendly and nucleus friendly. I'm speeding up a little bit. Okay. All the Lewis acids are electrophile. But sometimes species that have a dipole moment can also behave like, nucleo like electrophiles. So, for example, uh, so the example that we have down there, because it can accept electrons, is an electrophile. If we take CH3 chloride, which has a dipole moment here, delta minus, delta plus on the carbon, this carbon here is an electrophile. Like this entire species is an electrophile and this is an electrophilic carbon. It means it can accept electron density. Now what is a nucleophile? So a nucleophile is pretty much the opposite. Uh, it contains at least one pair, one lone pair of electron, which is the same definition as a Lewis base, and therefore all nucleophiles are Lewis bases. So an example of a Lewis base can be uh, deprotonated water. Oops. Here. And again, the electrons go towards the most electron deficient site. So you have the electrons on the oxygen that can attack on the electrophilic carbon. And again, if I leave this here, we're going to end up with Texas carbon with five bonds, and that's terrible. So we always push the electrons away. And so you end up making methanol and chloride minus. Now the overall effect in this reaction is that we have replaced one nucleophile because Cl minus can also be a nucleophile. So theoretically, that reaction could go back. That's my alarm. Sorry. Okay. So we've replaced the chloride by an OH group. And so this reaction is called a nucleophilic substitution. Substitution. 
where we take one nucleophile and replace it with another. And this is one of the most classic example of chemical reaction you'll ever find. And a whole has to do with the periodic table. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>